can be difficult. And so the purpose of this course is because the concept of bid'ah and its impact uh, is something none of us are free of, right? Uh, because if you want to live life according to Sunnah, then we will have to face this phenomenon we know as bid'ah. So it's important to understand what it actually is. So you probably heard this term being thrown around, that this is bid'ah and that is bid'ah, and we have this whole bid'ah brigade, which likes to make everything an issue. Yet on the other hand, you also have some people who take the sunnah so lightly that you hear them saying, oh, this is just the sunnah, as if it has no importance whatsoever. So we have two extremes, one who thinks everything is a bid'ah and the other who thinks that sunnah has no value whatsoever. But as a matter of principle, remember, when you ever have two extremes, know that the right path is somewhere in the middle. It's never extreme. It's always something which is between the two. It's not just in this topic, in this composition, but in anything you study and hear about the Sharia, Whenever you find that there are two extremes, know that there is a middle path. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, this book is from al Assam. Let's start. But before we actually start the book and introduce, the question is why now? Why start this course right now? If the very end of Ramadan, one might think, well, you know, if it started at the beginning of Ramadan, it would have some that uh, even have more value to it, right? And it's just a few days till the end of Ramadan, then why not start after Ramadan? Uh, well, there are a couple of reasons for that, and I think you should know. Uh, first of all, like I mentioned, that this is a very scholarly book uh, in its essence. So in order to distill it so it's understandable to a larger audience, that takes time. And we underestimate it. Uh, the depth of this book. And so we wanted to begin the course much earlier, but we couldn't con confidently say that we had it in under grasp until this time. That's the first reason. The second reason why we chose to do it in Ramadan uh, is because Ramadan is the month of Barakah and the month of Al Az wa Niyyah. And the Prophet Ali Islam, he mentions in a hadith, mentioned almost all of the major hadith literature, uh, that your actions will be determined by the intentions that you make and the motivations that you have. So the purpose of at least having one class in Ramadan uh, is that we make the proper niya for taking this course. And that is to make the intention of understanding what is bid'ah so that we ourselves can avoid falling into that trap and also become a light that guides people towards what is the true sunnah. Now, this is a very bold thing to make to be able to uh, do something as profound as this. And I'm going to go off and state it very clearly in the very beginning that you will not become an expert in identifying Vida just after this course. You will have foundational groundwork which can help you navigate. But do not expect to be able to just by reading one book or taking a course on one book, you'll be able to master the topic. In order to successfully identify what an actual bid'ah is and what is would be considered against sunnah you need to have knowledge about the sunnah in general about what constitutes as sunnah you need to have knowledge about the sunnah fiqh how the fuqaha interact with the quran hadith and what they took out their principles only then are you actually capable of making a proper judgment on what is sunnah what is not what will constitute as bid'ah and what will not, right? And this is very important to know. It will help you understand. It will give you a groundwork to for further study and for further understanding. But in no way is taking this course giving you the rights 
to judge others' people's actions. That will be left to the senior ulama, the senior scholars. If you think there's there's a situation which is happening in your family, in your country, present it to the ulama, present it to the senior scholars, and wait for their judgment. If they tell you it's okay, it's mobile, it's permissible, stick with that. If they tell you, no, this is actual without, then you can speak against it. But for the most part, on your own, from your own self, don't try to do this. So that disclaimer apart, starting this course in Ramadan is for the purpose that to gain the barakah, to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and support, that Ya Allah give me the understanding of sunnah and give me the understanding of bid'ah. So I can follow the first and I can save myself from the second. The other hadith is in al-A'mal bil khawatim that the ends decide the amal, the amal that you do at the end decides everything. And so in Ramadan, we're ending it with wanting to understand what is sunnah and what is the da'ah. So inshallah, hopefully this will be a positive note to the end of our Ramadan in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then give us more guidance and more strength for the rest of the year when it comes to this topic. Now obviously, as-silah al-mu'min wa huwa dua, right? So, silah al-mu'min wa dua, qalahu Ali radiyallahu anhu. So, Ali radiyallahu anhu mentioned that dua is the weapon of the believer, right? And the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned, La ta'ajizu fi dua'i. Hey, don't get fed up with dua or don't become weak when it comes to making dua. فَإِنَّهُ لَنْ يَهْلِكَ مَعَ الدُّعَاءِ أَحَدٌ Nobody with dua is ever going to break or die away. Right? So dua is very powerful. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the dunya, something from the dunya, and He may not give you the thing that you want in this life. But if you ask Him for hidayah and if you ask Him for deen, that is something that he will not withhold from you. He's some, that's something that he will, inshallah, give to you in this life. Because essentially that is for the afterlife. And so I'll give you two other uh, that we should all make a part of our lives. And these dua are very related to our topic. One is mentioned in Surah Al-Imran in the Quran. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزَخْلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا that, oh Allah, do not let our hearts go astray after you have given us the hidayah and grant us from your own, from your special place, ar rahma because you are the all-giving. Right? So this verse was mentioned about those people who leave that which is very clear from the verses of the Qur'an and try to take up those verses, uh, which could be a bit confusing to some people. And so they deliberately go after the confusion, creating from it problems and creating from it beliefs and actions which were not part of Islam. So literally this dua is us asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from bid'ah. The other dua is from Umar radiallahu anhu, and he used to make this dua, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa razuqna tiba'a. Ya Allah, show us the truth as the truth. Because sometimes you may have the truth, but because of a wrong perception or because of wrong understanding, you might think of it to be bad. You might think that it's false. You might think that it's wrong. Well, actually, it was the haqiqah. It was the truth in the first place. So, Ya Allah, show us the truth as the truth and nothing else. And not just the knowledge, also grant us the ability to act on it. Because knowledge without action, uh, it's not sufficient. It's not going to do you any good. And show us falsehood as false. And grant us the power to abstain from it. Grant us abstinence from it. Don't show us falsehood as if it's the truth. Like the shaitan Allah mentions in the Quran, 
uh, لهم, that he makes the amal of the kuffar logical in their eyes that this is the best thing that's happened if this is the right thing to do this is the truth but that's just not the case so these two dua are very potent and this is something that we should make a habit of doing when it comes to this topic of bid'ah uh, for in general for our lives as well so after every prayer one should make a habit of making this dua and inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us the right path now once we're aside with the brief introductions now let's dive into the contents of the course and we start off with a hadith of the prophet alayhi uh, salam mentioned in sahih at tirmizi so the prophet alayhi salam he mentioned in al islam badda ghariban wa sayyuru qalbi that indeed islam began as something strange and it will return to being something strange just as it was in the beginning so glad tidings are for the strangers what does this hadith mean well this hadith has a different chains and there are different variations in this hadith uh, one reason could be because the concept of a reviable matter so what used to happen is the sahaba they used to hear something from the prophet of islam that instead of mentioning the exact same words they would transmit this hadith in ma'na so the meaning would stay intact the essence would be stay intact but the sahaba would use different words for it for themselves that is one possible way why there are different variations for this hadith the other possibility is that this hadith was not mentioned by the prophet islam just once but multiple times in multiple occasions so explaining the same concept in different words so it's coming from the prophet al-islam himself and if you look at the hadith the second uh, possibility uh, or the second interpretation seems more plausible right so what are the variations so the prophet al-islam mentioned fatuba lil ghuraba hina yufsilu nas so glad tidings to the strangers when are these glad tidings in hina yufsidu nas when people cause corruption what is this corruption that the prophet is talking about well in other hadith narration of the same hadith he mentions fatuba lil ghuraba glad tidings to the strangers and who are those strangers those who hold tight onto the Quran and its knowledge when it has been forsaken. I when you are taking in left and right, but you have thrown the Quran behind you, then the strangers will be those people who grasp onto the Quran tightly and adhere to what is written in the Quran. That is their first quality, the second quality. And they follow the sunnah when the sunnah has died. Like when the sunnah is no longer being acted upon, people are unaware of it in a society. But that person chooses to follow the sunnah. And people around them are saying, like, what is up with this fear, though? Then such a person, he is from the strangers, and there's glad tidings for such people. Right? In other version of the hadith, he explains this further by saying, al ghuraba they are those who revive the sunnah that people have forsaken. So those sunnah that the people do not take care of anymore, those people who would revive them should be amongst the Quraba. I'll give you one example of this. Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions that the first bid'ah, she uses the word bid'ah, that came upon us or that we saw after the demise of the prophet السلام, was al min al to eat until one is full so she's considering this as an innovation which means that nabi السلام, and the sahab in his time they probably could not fathom eating until they are full every single time three times a day and Look at our societies now. Not just that we have 
three meals a day for most the majority of us we have in between snacks as well right and a lot of people eat till they're actually full whether it be breakfasts lunch or dinner especially dinner and strangely enough dinner was something that the prophet ali islam and his family would mostly lead about. so if there was like one meal of a day which they usually did not have that would be dinner and yet you see most people filling themselves up to the brim when it comes to dinner okay so these variations in what used to happen in the sunnah and what is happening right now so those who revive the sunnah when people have forsaken it those who actually eat very little those who rarely ever fill their cells okay those are the what about ask people and tell them about this diet and how this is the sunnah and they keep telling you uh well that that's impossible or you're gonna get weak at the end maybe you're young right now you can't feel it but when you get old uh you know you're gonna get very weak in the bones and everything those people never that never happened to them why should it happen now so these are things to consider right so if you take out all of the meanings of the different variations of the same hadith the ghuraba are basically those who adhere to the teachings of islam as they were in the ula, in the time of the prophet -Islam, in the time of the sahaba for the most part right So these are the Uraba. And to understand this Uraba, uh, those of us who studied the Sira or who know the Sira, you would know before Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he was a man of great honor and dignity within the society of Makkah. So he was a Sadiq al Wa'di al Amin. He was the most truthful, trustworthy person that there was in Mecca, right? Such and such when it came time to renovate the Kaaba, and then the issue came to who is going to place Al Hajar al Aswad, the black stone. When they were renovating the Kaaba, all the tribes came together in perfect harmony, they worked. But it, when it came time for placing the black stone, swords came out. But when it was decided that Muhammad وسلم, was the one going to make the decision, everybody agreed there was no voice in objection. That was the status that he had in that society, right? So everybody, you know, revered him, everybody loved him and respected him. They knew of his intelligence, they knew of his trustworthiness, they knew of his riffa, of his haya and everything. And yet, when that same person, at the age of 40, spending 40 years in that society with everybody knowing him, comes with the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, comes with the wahi of the wahi, of worshipping only one God, forsaking shuk and everything else. The majority, almost the entire society flipped. And now those who are saying that this is the most truthful person labeled him with gift, with falsehood. Who, those who knew of his amana, of his aql, of his intellect, they accused him of being insane or being a magician, right? So, so many accusations in just the blink of an eye. So this ghurba, this being strange, the feeling of being a stranger you and i can feel that take a moment take a moment in the society you live in in the family you live in and imagine that everybody around you now hates you nobody's talking to you everybody who looked up to you and now looks at you as if you were some weirdo and if you're some weird person who doesn't know what they're talking about think of people thinking you are insane has no idea what they're doing or someone who is misguided by passion how weird that would feel and we don't hold the same status as prophet Ali did in his society so think how hard it would have been on him right 
And so that is how Islam began, as a complete stranger. People were unwilling to accept anything that was happening, right? So all things were happening. Uh, they were offering uh, solutions to him, you know? Maybe we worship your God, Allah, one day, and then you could worship our idols the other day. How about that? Or maybe you just, you know, keep quiet, let us do what we do, and we let you do what you do, right? Don't speak against us. That's also something they offered. There came a time they offered, Ya Muhammad, maybe it's leadership and kingdom that you want over us. So we will unanimously agree to make you our leader and king. Maybe it's wealth that you want. We'll gather all of the wealth of Makkah and bring it to you. Maybe, you know, you you want to get married. So we'll get the most beautiful woman that there is for you to get married. Or maybe, you know, you've been affected by uh, black magic. So we'll get the best healers. We'll heal you. Whatever is it that you want, please tell us. Right? And the Prophet Islam is like, no, that's my mission. And when Abu Talib who was a strong supporter, he came to him and said that, Yabna Oh, my nephew, I become very difficult on me. Please accept the offer. And he said, Ya Ammi, uh, my uncle, uh, I've been given with a task that I'm going to do. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will complete it on my hand or my head is going to roll off. But I'm not going to stop. So that kind of urba, he began with his mission. But, you know, as Islam, as days went by, person after person ex kept accepting Islam. Within the lifetime of the Prophet Islam, the whole of Jazeera al-Arab became Muslim. And then the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, the empire, the Persian and the Byzantine empire also came under Islamic rule. Now this entire vast area is covered by Islam. The ilm of Islam is being spread. So you have muhaddithin, fuqaha, qurra, everywhere people learning Islam, just like they're enrolled in the kind of Western education that we have today. Everybody's focused on learning the Quran, learning the hadith, learning from the Sahaba. And now that qurba that they had, that strange feeling, no longer exists. Everybody's aware of Islam, uh, you know, Everybody knows what is happening. Everybody knows everything. Yet we're on the helm of uh, world leadership. The best universities are in the Islamic empire, in Spain, for example, uh, in Baghdad, in Kufa, in Basra. Right? All of the progress that is being made, whether it be in the fields of physical sciences, in the field of psychological sciences or what we know as social sciences, a lot of progress was being made in the time of the Islamic empire, right? And so Islam then was not weird, but as the Prophet Islam prophesied in the hadith that she mentioned, if the Jews and the Christians were divided into 71 or 72. Uh, sex and so will happen that my ummah will divide into 73 different sects. He prophesied this, and the prophecy then came true as Islam started becoming weak, it started breaking off into different fractions. You had the Khariji, you had the Wafis, uh, you had the Mu'tazili, the Zahiri, and everything. So 73 different firaq that is going to be something that is going to happen. The ummah will face divide. And that division is that there was a time when you had the Qatra, the Im entire empire with just one Islam, so many people to support you. Now they're breaking off into different fractions. Those on the Haq will start limiting down, shrinking, 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 till there are very few. So you have all of this thought and all of this wrong, all of this evil, which is the majority, and then the very small minority, which is on the hook. And obviously when you're a minority, you are strangers, you're the what about, you're doing things 
which people aren't accustomed to. So you're the problem. And that's what's happening today. With so many fit up and so many opinions, uh, we're losing sight of what actually was Sunnah, right? And so the Prophet Islam, he prophesied that this was going to happen. We saw that at the beginning of Islam, and we're seeing that happening. Right? So this is something that is going to happen. Now, Imam al-Shatabi, he mentions a very relatable experience. He mentions the experience of Hafiz ibn Badha uh, as he describes what he faced. And so he mentions that I went to Makkah and Khurasan, people who knew me and people who did not know me. Right? What kind of situation did I face with people? Well, he says, if I confirmed someone in what they were saying and gave them permission in doing something, right? As he mentions that people of this time used to do, you can, you can see the glimpse of that today. So there are so many people, especially on the internet, that give you permission to do everything. You know, you can go ahead and drink alcohol because that was something culturally the Arabs were really engaged in a lot of facade. Now that's not the case. Or you can do riba because um, it wasn't consensual that time, now it is, or even homosexuality, same reasoning, wasn't consensual, now it is. So you have such people who you know, give you permission on doing things, you know, those imams and masajid and centers. So if I confirm what they were saying and give them permission in that, they would label me as the one agreement that I'm a supporter. But if I had reservations about even a single word or letter about their actions, they would label me as a muhalif, as this is our opponent, our enemy. If I mention regarding any of the words and the deeds that are mentioned in the Kitab was Sunnah, right, uh, that have been related to different to what these people are saying, I would be labeled as a kharij. Uh, and if I mention a hadith regarding Tukdoki, they would say that I'm an anthro, anthropomorphist, a eh, that those are the groups that say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has limbs just like the human beings do. Uh, in Arabic, they're known as the Mushabbiha, right? And he says that if I ever mention a hadith regarding a ru'ya, the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter, uh, that it's mentioned in various hadith and even some of the words of the Quran, there's a hint that if the Day of Judgment, the believers in Jannah are going to view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're going to see by their own eyes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if I mentioned any hadith regarding to that, they would call me a Salimi. A Salimi is someone who uh, rejects that notion. If I regard, if I mention a hadith regarding Iman, faith, they would call me a murji. A murji is someone who says that uh, Iman, if you bring Iman, if you uh, accept Islam, that is sufficient for salvation. So Moruji is someone who says that once you accept Iman, you can do whatever you like, you won't be held account for that. And then he mentions, if I mention a hadith regarding actions, uh, he would label me a Qadri, someone who denies predestination, uh, who divides decree and divine providence. And if I mention about uh kenosis kenosis you would mention me <clears throat> and if it were regarding the virtues of abu Bakr and umar he would call me a nasiri if it were regarding the virtues of the family of the prophet he would label me a rafi a shia and if i kept silent about an explanation of an ayur hadith and just mentioned the exact ayur hadith I would be labeled as a literalist on Lahiri, someone who doesn't believe in the interpretation of the Quran and Hadith and takes the word as the power.
if I replied with an interpretation that it is not exactly the 100% words of the hadith or the ayah, they would call me uh, a batil, someone who manipulates the text and the nizus for which we are going for. If I replied with ta'wil interpretation, they would label me an ash'ari. And if I rejected uh, an ayah or a hadith, not the actual sense, but the understanding of the questioners. So if you have an understanding of an ayah or hadith, an ayah will accept that. Then you would say, I would be labeled as a Muqtazim or rationalist. If the hadith was regarding traditions about the recitation of Fatiha behind the Imam, like if I mentioned those hadiths, he would call me a Shafari. And if it were regarding the Qunut, that the Qunut is to be recited in Wither prayer, not in Fajr prayer, I would be labeled a Hanafi. If it were regarding the nature of Quran, that the Quran is not a creation of Allah SWT, they would label me a Hanbali. And if I mention the strongest view among all the reports, which people took as their position. So different people took different hadiths, and we said that I took the one that was the strongest hadith. Right? The reason why there's no prejudice or favoritism in legal rulings and hadith, we should adopt that which is the strong. But if I did such a thing, I would be accused of insulting other people's intent. The khulasa is whatever I did, there was always someone to point. There was always someone to accuse. People were not happy. Right? So this is how it is in the Maktab's experience. Imam Shambi calls on that, that my situation was very similar to this. So once I had acquired the knowledge that Allah SWT wanted me to acquire, uh, I did the things that people will do. So he became a khatib, he became a khutbah. And he noticed that people, you know, they were involved with a lot of innovations, a lot of bid'ah. And so he decided that gradually and slowly he would guide them towards the sin. And lo and behold, the first time that he spoke against them, uh, literally, uh, he had so many enemies everywhere, and everybody was talking against them, that what is this news that they're bringing to us? even when they had no proof for the innovations that they had created. And it's time for us to relate. Think about an experience. If you were in the field of Dawah and Bagdil, if you're doing that work, if you're in the field of Ilm as well, and you've ever had the chance of holding an opinion that a class general does not accept, or the fiqh that you're associated with does not accept, uh, have you ever had that experience uh, where you're labeled as different? Uh, where you're labeled as being wrong? Where you're labeled with some of these uh, al qabat these titles? Personally, I have the experience of being labeled with this thing, so I can relate. And if you ever had this work done, you can relate that as well. In fact, pick any major scholar, past or present, and you will not find that a group of people is not speaking against them. Right? From the Ahad of Sunnah, take any major scholar, and you will find someone out there that is pointing fingers, that is talking behind their backs and giving them names and everything. So that is the kind of experience that if you take on the role of following and inviting towards the Sunnah and speaking up against the Bidah. That is something that more or less everyone has to face. And so we have two choices. You have choice number one, in which you can actually just follow what everybody else is doing. Close your eyes to the light of the Quran and Sunnah and do what everyone else does. And if you're a person of the ilm, if you are sahib al ilm, and people are coming to us, ask you questions then answer them with what they want and not, which is the truth, right? In that way, you probably make most people happy. 
you can never meet everybody, right? Because if there are two different opinions. You favor this one, this one's going to speak against you. Favor this one, this one's going to speak against you. That's all this one. So it's impossible to make every person happy. If you're lucky enough, you'll make most people happy. But as a result, you will make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very on the other hand, you can choose to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. And most people will get happy. Okay? But just know that you are going to die one day. So the choice, you have choice number eight. Uh, on the hisab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sacrificing his pleasure, you may try to Or by making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you displease. That is the option that you have. And so, but before you make a decision, know of the virtue that there is in reviving the sunnah. In I'll mention two hadith, both of them are mentioned in Dimitri. Uh, Ibn Wahab narrates from the Prophet, Islam, he mentioned whoever revives a tradition, a sunnah, from my sunnah, that has been deadened after that the people have forsaken so and so that it doesn't exist right he will have the reward equal to all of the people who act right so if you revive a sunnah in your society and then let's say a hundred people start acting on that sunnah you will get the virtue of a hundred following the sunnah. they're not going to lose anything from their ajah but you will get the equivalent of a hundred ajal as well, right? You will have a reward equal to all the people who act upon it without reducing their rewards at all. And the opposite is also true that whoever introduced a misguided innovation with on a sunnah sahiha, then not only will you get the sin of that, but everybody who acts on that sin, acts on that bid'ah, uh, the sin of that is going to go on the initial where it was going. So notice the problems if you do endorse people in their evil, in their sin, in their bidda, and the benefits you would get if you endorse that, which is true. And there are the hadith the Prophet Islam he mentions. Uh, oh my son, if you're able to begin the morning and reach the evening without any grudge towards anyone can try to do so. So start your day and end your day without holding a grudge against anyone. Not some bad event might happen, but before you end the day, just take a look at your heart and say, Oh, I forget that person. Make excuses for them. And so this is the sunnah of the prophet. If you can do that without holding a grudge for any of them, do so. He said, oh, my son, for that is my word. That is my sunnah. Not holding words against people. And whoever revives my sunnah loves me. And whoever loves me, then he made an ishara like this, two fingers together, not even space between them, will be in the jannah with me like this. So imagine that you revive the sunnah, you will be with the Prophet and Islam. Or right next to Allah, such a great festival. So these are just some of the many hadith there for the virtue of reviving the Sunnah. I think these two suffice. Then you have those two options against displease Allah by pleasing people, or attempt at pleasing people, or displease the people by attempting to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best of key ability. And so a quote by Imam Shadabi sums this all up. To perish in following the Sunnah is salvation. Al Halaq fit Tibari Sunnah Najatun. To perish in following the Sunnah, in the way of Sunnah, understanding, reviving, practicing, and inviting towards the Sunnah. If the world's against you, they not just by speech, by hands, and by fists. You know, if they're throwing rocks at you, if they're willing to shoot you, to die in that path, that is najat, that is salvation, that is inshallah going to get you into jannah. 
and people below they can do nothing without Allah's will. If Allah has written for you Shahada, you die in the best place. But if Allah has already planned to protect you, it does not matter who stands against you. It does not matter how many of them stand against you, they cannot do anything. The hadith is very clear when it comes to other. Now, Ananas, Ijtama'u, Ayyan Fa'u, Kalishay, all people gather and they want to benefit you. Layyan Fa'u, Ka illa Bima Qadab Allah. They're not going to benefit you except what Allah has already written for you, decreed for you. Wa in Ijtama'u, Ayyan Zuru, Kalishay. And if they gather to harm you, they can't, they don't have the power except that which Allah is already doing. This super the pens have been lifted and the ink has dried and nothing. Keeping that in mind, focusing that in mind, you perish in the Sunnah is salvation. So our lives should be dedicated for this purpose and this, this element.